Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are here to celebrate um, an Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month with an amazing culinary panel. Um, I am Anna, I am from Jackson District Library. And um, joining us this evening, we have some amazing panelists from all over the country that are going to share their culinary uh, heritage stories with you. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentations, please feel free to put them in the chat or ask via Q and A. Um, however, you would like to ask those questions. We hope that you will put them in the chat however you want. Um, we are um, excited to hear your questions. Okay, so I have some introductions. I am, sorry, I'm just changing my view. Um, okay, with us this evening, I can get my little screen. So meet the panelists. Tonight we have with us Danilo Balin. Uh, he teaches, researches, and publishes technology and integration, practices visual and media literacy skills, creativity and collaboration at the University of West Georgia, while also studying the visual representation of identity, relationships, and culture in Asian children's literature. Dr. Balin has co-edited five books and a special section in Tech Trends and is one of the 2022-2023 Fulbright US Scholars. Tina Chan joins us from MIT. She is the Reference Services Program Manager and Humanities Librarian at Massachusetts Institute of Technology Libraries. She is the liaison to the Global Languages Department and the Writing Program, and is currently the coordinator-elect of ALA Sustainability Roundtable. Brian Leaf is the executive director of NNLM Region 3, an NIH slash NLM funded program office that serves the state of Arkansas, the states, excuse me, of Arkansas, Kansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas. He is passionate about outreach and trying to find ways to serve marginalized and underrepresented populations through health information. Charisma Lee was born in Manila and raised in Denver and currently works as a librarian at the DC Public Library. And Tuja Vang is Director of Learning Resources and Professional Development Coordinator for Montgomery Community College located in Troy, North Carolina. He has worked with refugees and first generation college students for over 15 years. His engaged approach to deliver, oh, excuse me, his experience and research with underrepresented populations inform his community engaged approach to delivering library and information services. And without further ado, um, we're just gonna start with a little bit of background for each of our speakers. They're going to share with you what culinary heritage means to them or how they have shared that um, and how that's been handed down through their families. So we're gonna start with Brian. Take it around, take it away, Brian. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I, I think I was a little extra today and I have slides, but I'll keep it under five minutes, I promise. <laughs> um, okay, let me know if you can see this. All right, great. So since this was a panel, uh, sorry, since this was a panel about heritage, I thought I'd start out with a picture of a few of my cousins and I. There are 13 of us total in our generation, but unlike everyone else, I didn't grow up in the San Gabriel Valley, which um, if you don't know, uh, it, that's in California. It's the largest and most concentrated enclave of Asian Americans in the country. Um, some of you might have a similar story, but growing up in an Arizona suburb, uh, not learning the language or growing up immersed in larger family traditions during my formative years. I never felt like I truly belonged when visiting our extended family or in my Arizona community either. So going into adulthood, I feel like I had a really tenuous relationship with my heritage. Um, my parents weren't really concerned about keeping up with old traditions or documenting their history, nor did they have strong ties to China. They were actually born and raised in a Chinese village in Vietnam, so they were a cultural mishmash too. I probably learned more about the history of China from watching um, Mulan or Ip Man. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't until grad school that I started to take an interest in celebrating my heritage. And since no one really celebrated Lunar New Year in North Carolina, I would start hosting a small dinner, basically serving takeout from a Chinese restaurant and, and watching one of those films. 
uh, as someone that liked to cook, it, it did naturally lend itself to an interest in learning more of my family's recipes at that point. They had never taught me how to cook as a kid. So my experience was really only with Western dishes. Uh, but I started calling up my parents and asking them how to cook certain dishes or when I would visit, uh, visit home, ask them to slow down so I could properly document everything, which could be kind of tough because they didn't work from recipes. They didn't measure things out. It was all from feel. So it made for some, you know, you know, sort of lighthearted fights in the kitchen trying to figure out what they meant by, you know, just do it until it looks right. <laughs> And that's been happening for over a decade now. I've been collecting family recipes and my Lunar New Year celebrations have slowly evolved over time. Um, and I started going outside of the family to learn restaurant favorites like this hot and sour soup. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, when COVID-19 hit, I'd kind of stagnated by that point. It had been a, a year or two since I'd learned anything new. But my interest was renewed when I was hanging out with my uh, cousin in Philly when we were discussing food and family right at the beginning of 2020. And so when quarantine hit, I decided to take on a new challenge. Uh, one of my mom's favorite dishes and a traditional Chinese recipe usually made and eaten during the Dragon Boat Festival, which is a holiday in China. Um, it's a savory sticky rice dumpling that I know of in Cantonese as zhong. It's sort of like a tamale, except that it's glutinous rice with pork belly, salted egg, mung, mung beans, peanuts, sometimes other ingredients. And it's wrapped in bamboo leaves and boiled for hours. Just a single one can be pretty filling. Now, this wasn't even a dish that my mom really knew how to make. The recipe I use is a variation from my late grandma that would make this communally with her, with, with family, with her, with her sons and daughters. Um, you know, and so I, I think that's probably another parallel that it has with tamales um, and Latinx families. Uh, but with translation help from my cousins, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I asked my aunts uh, and there was a little bit of a language barrier there, but I became the first person of my generation to learn how to make it, much to my aunts and much to my mom's surprise. I definitely felt proud and also a bit of redemption that, you know, I'm the one that gets to carry that torch and help lead that legacy through food. And whereas I didn't grow up with strong traditions, I've been able to create my own and share it with my community of friends. And one of the components I've added over the years is recruiting a, a smaller group of friends to learn how to cook some of these dishes, which is in part to share out my heritage. And, um, it also helps with scalability when you're trying to feed a large group of people. <laughs> but mostly it's cool to have friends that want to learn and work with ingredients uh, that they likely have never used or have very little experience with. Um, and it seems especially appropriate to do it family style with this dish. So um, that's my story. Uh, thank you for indulging uh, me and my slides. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to throw in the chat a link to one of the recipes that um, that I actually typically cook for Lunar New Year. It's, it's pretty simple. It's my mom's rice porridge, along with notes directly from her. Um, so enjoy, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, that was amazing. And I cannot wait to try that recipe, which I'm sure I will be terrible at at first. Also those dumplings sound amazing. Um, very similar to tamales, which I also love. Okay, um, I could talk about food for hours. Next up, we have Charisma Lee, and she is going to share her story with us. I don't have any slides. I don't know how many of you can tell from my Zoom background, um, some very specific references to Filipino food culture. Um, and the main thing I want to point out to you is the wooden fork. And I'm laughing because, okay, it's a wooden fork and spoon in the background, which um, if you are a Filipino uh, person of Filipino heritage watching this, you'll be very familiar with this kitchen decor. It's like in, I would say, most Filipino households, at least that I saw growing up. Um, but I also point to this, to those wooden utensils behind me because it's kind of emblematic of my own culinary heritage in the sense that I didn't really grow up cooking or eating Filipino food despite having been born in Manila. Um, I came to the US when I was six, 1989, and I grew up on a steady diet of other Asian cuisines except for Filipino food. 
as well as a steady diet of American junk food. Um, I will say though, again, similar to Brian, it's not until that I got older, college and grad school, that I really started considering the history, not just the history of Filipino food, but Filipino history in general, as well as, you know, the different ties we have, for example, to our uh, legacies of colonialism and imperialism um, in the Philippines, as well as how that specifically relates to food. So for example, um, there are these lollipops called chupa chups, which I thought like white rabbit and other things that are actually not Filipino <laughs> were Filipino origin. And then I, uh, I moved to Spain for a while and I discovered there were a Spanish import. So that led me to discovering that all my childhood favorites were not actually of Filipino origin. For example, um, hopia, uh, I guess I, I think they are mooncakes. I also thought they were Filipino, but uh, there's many Filipino Chinese uh, in the Philippines and also um, the Chinese diasporas around the world. So it wasn't surprising uh, for me to discover that. Anyway, so um, unlike Brian, I will say again, I have not learned how to cook any of these wonderful Filipino foods. Um, and one of, the, one of the major reasons is because I'm a vegetarian I was vegan for a year, did not try, did not pan out, um, but I am in the process of trying to figure out how to veganize some of the traditional dishes, especially to help uh, my mom and my stepdad in their culinary adventures when I when I visit them. Thank you so much, Charisma. And I honestly was not familiar with the. Um the wooden spoon and fork. I also love the poster. Um, I'm not sure. I can't read what the title is. It um, like a, a brand of some sort or uh, what is the significance of the poster? Oh, so the poster mm -hmm. in the background is the cover of a book that is called Tikim. And it's a collection of essays. Oh, by the way, Tikim means taste in Tagalog. And it's um, a collection of essays by this renowned food critic, uh, Doreen Fernandez Gamboa. Note to self and to everyone else to read the king. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but thank you so much for sharing your story. Okay, up next we have Danilo Balan. Danilo, please share with us your thoughts on culinary heritage. I'm really smiling and while Charisma was talking because I'm Filipino also, but a very different experience, okay? Um, I grew up in the Philippines and so my connection to food are the fiestas. You know, uh, I think many of you are familiar with, you know, fiesta, especially with uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, but in the Philippines, especially at this time of the year, May, June, July, every town have their own celebration for their patron saints. And so uh, for a day uh, of, that, uh, of that month, you know, the town uh, opened their houses, townspeople opened their houses and invite people, you know, to partake, you know, different kinds of food. And so, so Fiesta for me was very memorable, you know, uh, growing up. However, like, um, like Charisma, I didn't learn how to cook. I learned to eat, but you know, didn't learn how to cook until I was grown and uh, I worked with refugee camps in Southeast Asia. And so um, in that um, context, I was living with 14 different people in a longhouse. And so what happens is that you have a common dining room. And so I end up buying things from the market, but most of my female colleagues would cook. And so I would watch them cook and enjoy. And then my refugee students would invite me to come to their billets. And so the Cambodians and Vietnamese and Laotians, you know, and share, you know, their cooking. And so that kind of opened my eyes to the possibility of me learning how to cook. So when I came in to the United States, you know, um, I had to survive, but then it reminded me a lot of Filipino cooking that I've seen from my parents, especially my father and my aunts. And so I, I decided to buy a recipe book, a Filipino recipe book, and started, you know, trying to 
to cook Filipino food. And what's interesting, like Brian, you know, uh, cooking, uh, I did not really follow the recipe. I followed the taste of the food or, you know, that I'm cooking. And so, and I came from the South in the Philippines, which is in Panay Island in Iloilo. And so most of our cooking are sweet. So I, you know, I keep on adding sugar, you know what I mean? You know, sour, add sugar, you know, hot, add sugar. And so my kind of cooking is a little bit different from the typical Filipino, you know, it's a little bit sweet because of my heritage, but also because of the refugee experience, it's a little hot than most of, you know, the typical Filipino cooking. Um, so that's one thing that, you know, I can remember in terms of connecting to food. Also, you know, for many of you from you know, with Filipino cooking, lechon is very big, roasted pig, you know, for one. And then All Souls Day, where you, you know, everybody cooks dessert, you know, to bring to the cemetery, you know, as an offering, you know, to their uh, loved ones who pass away. So these are some of the things that, you know, I've grown up with, and I look forward to sharing more with you. But thank you, Sharisma, for leading the Filipino talk here. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I'm, I didn't know um, about All Souls Day. I know that in a lot of um, Latinx and Hispanic cultures, you know, for Dia de los Muertos and that sort of thing, there is a lot of that same sort of thing with the ofrenda. So I find that interesting, the connection between those two. I didn't know that was also a, um, a Filipino holiday that was celebrated as well. So thank you. Okay, up next, we have Tina Chan. Tina, thank you so much for being here and share with us your amazing story. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And thank you to you and to the Jackson District Library for hosting us and having this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my story is a, a little bit of, of Brian's and Danilo's and Charisma's. Um, my parents were immigrants from Hong Kong. And so I grew up eating a lot of Chinese food. And um, my mother, every night, she'd always, you know, cooked for us, cooked for Chinese food for us. And then uh, when I had lunch at school, I ate the lunch that was at school. And I always thought it was kind of strange because I remember thinking uh, somebody said, you know, I said, what is this? And I, somebody said, this is meatloaf. I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I've never had that before. I mean, it, it tasted okay. I just didn't know what meatloaf was. And so then, you know, just growing up with two different kinds of foods, like one at the school and one at home, it was just kind of, uh, it was just different. Um, and so that's what I had um, growing up, having these two different kinds of foods. And then um, at Lunar New Year, it was always, you know, the lots of food and, you know, lots of the, the big gathering with my family. And it wasn't until I moved away that I, you know, when I lived on my own that I had to um, learn how to cook for myself or I could have bought, you know, bought food, but I wanted to learn how to cook as a way to keep in touch with my culture. And so, you know, I, there was no recipe or cookbook for my family it was just you know add whatever feels right you know it wasn't I we didn't measure I didn't see I never saw my mother or my father measure anything it was just they just poured whatever you know just add well, how much have our water how much water the rice takes you just do it and that's how I, what I did um so there was no no formal way of doing it it was just whatever felt right and um and so I had lived, you know, on my own for many years, trying to make simple recipes uh, that I had learned from my mother. And I remember when I was little, uh, looking back, I must have been, I don't know, five or six, and I would stand next to my mother, like watching her cook. And I never, I, I never said anything. I was just silent. I just stood next to her. I don't know why I did. I just stood next to her while she, you know, stir fry the rice or whatever. And so I was fascinated with, you know, her, her way of cooking. And so I tried to emulate that from what I saw um, when I was a child. And so as I grew up, you know, I wanted to, to keep that, that cultural um, relevance by, with, with the food. And I would ask, talk to her about the food and, you know, similar to what everybody else was like, well, you know, you just kind of learn on your own. And I read a little bit and tried, you know, trial and error. Um, 
and so now I actually um, live in the house that I grew up in, and I'm lucky that my mother lives uh, below me, <laughs> so that she gives me food. So I don't, I don't have to cook. But if I were, I would still have to. Um, I would still continue to cook on my own. So I am uh, very lucky that my mother lives below me and she still feeds me to this day. <laughs> but I know I, I am, am very lucky to have her, to have her, you know, so close to me that she gives me food. So I don't have to cook. <laughs> uh, I'm super jealous. I mean, I live in the same town as my mother, but she's, and she's going to probably murder me if she hears me say this live, but she, she did cook a lot of meatloaf. So there was that, but <laughs> I don't have the joy of an amazing cook for him. Sorry, mom, you're amazing in lots of different ways, but yeah. yeah she makes amazing uh, vegetarian dishes actually. So charisma, I should hook you up with my mom. She likes to cook things with uh, um, tofu a lot, which is interesting because we you know, we have no Asian background whatsoever in my family. So the tofu was, well, she was like a vegetarian before it was cool. And you know how that goes. Um, okay. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tina. Um, I want to meet your mom. She sounds awesome. Um, and next up we have Tujer. And thank you so much for being here with us and for sharing your story. So my story, um, I just want to call and, and make sure that I'm speaking as a refugee and I'm trying to focus on traditional Hmong food. Because being a refugee, I have the privilege of tasting a lot of food as a journey journey, my journey to the United States, for example, as a Hmong living in, in, in the mountain, my parents, you know, uh, we had traditional food and then being living in lowland and we exposed to Lao food and then we adapt that. And then we cross over to being a refugee in Thailand, we adapt Thai food and then come to the United States, you now live in the South um, was short, but I went up North, like uh, someone earlier said, I did not like American food. But then when I moved down South, I was exposed to South but um so what you know uh before this panel i was kind of like doing a little research and kind of like, when i google mong food a lot of food pop up those are not mong food those are adoptions that we have been adopted for the long journey our traditional food is mostly um uh, really vegetable um as as a cook you know as a young you know um usually boy don't cook but for the privilege i i was I have to cook <laughs> because of my family. And so my father was a mere colonel, so he was very strict. He wanted all of us to cook. I had one sister, and she cooked. But I remember every time she cooked, the boys had to wash the dish, set up table. And Did we lose audio for Tudor? One second, please. I'm, we're not, uh, your audio is not coming through. Sorry about that. Keep going. All good. Mofo is, is, is all about celebration, both marriage, uh, uh, you know, something, occasion, you know, death, you know, funeral. Uh, and then New Year celebration. Uh, one of the things I want to focus is on New Year celebration is that uh, even though we have kind of, you know, when you say Hmong New Year, people see a different day, people don't understand, but it's very important that we have something big fest, you know, and so traditionally during New Year, we eat a lot of meat, you know, anything occasion is always about meat. And so you have to learn how to slaughter, uh, slaughter an animal, you know, how to butcher an animal, how to process an animal, pig or cow. So as as you can go to Hmong food, you can tell by classism, you know, that even, even within the Hmong culture, there's classism. But look at the food they eat, you know, is it vegetable, is it meat? Or is it, what kind of meat? Is it chicken, pork, or beef? You can tell, you know, so those kind of classism exists within the Hmong culture that without speaking. And so a lot of young people don't understand or may not know about exposures that, but in, in like, for example, in funeral, we cannot eat hot pepper traditionally, okay? And it's all have to be meat. It can't be vegetable. Because if you eat vegetable, that means that you're poor. <laughs> and it's the responsibility of the family to feed the guests. So, you know, we butcher a lot of animals to feed, to create a lot of feast. And it's 24 seven. And so, so depending on you, if you're young, your funeral is very simple. You know, but if you're older, if you're especially your grandparents, your funeral lasts about four or five days, 24 seven. So there's a lot of food involved. And a lot of, and so, you know, because 
after the funeral, you will have reputation. Oh, that family was so good. They treat their grandparents, they treat, treat their grandmother very good. Oh, that parents, so, they're, they're so bad, they, they can't do anything for the, kid, the grandparents. So that kind of stuff. So food is very important in terms of traditional. And so food mostly are boiled, are really, um, 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 you know, kind of not really fancy. It's really traditional food. It's, uh, it's traditional Hmong food. What you Google, when you Google Hmong food online, we see egg roll, nam van, all those are adoption food. You know, egg roll adapted from Vietnam, Vietnamese food or Thai food. Navan is literally as a sweet drink from Thailand, Laos, or pho, you know, all kind of stuff. Those are adoption food that we have adapted to Hmong culture, you know, twisted to make it Hmong taste, I guess. So they call Hmong food. <laughs> but really it is, but traditional, we eat a lot of vegetable and it is expected in a family that if you are um, to raise one, one pig every year, we use it as a cut board, a board, I mean, a um, pig that's been cut. And you raise the pig all year round. And at the end of the year, you kill that pig and you cook a big feast and you invite everybody in the village to come eat. And so that's why it's a rotation. All people eat all around the new year. You know, you eat the one house, you go the next day and the next day, because that's our tradition. And that's how you celebrate food totally in more culture. Yeah. I'll stop here and then we'll ask questions and I'll add more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I find that so interesting that, I mean, I wonder how many times people have Googled Hmong food and then they see an egg roll and you're like, oh no, that's wrong. So you need to like set, set up a blog to and correct everybody's inaccuracies about Hmong food. Yes, I was, I, I saw that in uh, Wikipedia. I want to correct that. Wikipedia, page. oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you can correct Wikipedia. Thank goodness. Yes. Good grief, Wikipedia. I mean, we love it, but yes, yeah. it does have some issues. Um, okay, um, once again, if you have questions for our panelists, please um, share them in the chat. Um, and um, we do have um, one question already. I'm sorry, and I should have put my glasses on. This is like so bad. Um, okay, for any or all panelists, how has your exploration and research of food and food origins slash customs enriched your relationships? And feel free to jump in, anyone, to answer that. For me, it kind of brings me connection to my grandmother and appreciation of her of making moon, uh, rice liquor. <laughs> she has passed, and I never understood why she drink one shot every morning until the end. And she gave me, a, and she said, this has helped me live a long life. And so she taught me a lot of traditional recipe in terms of that. So my relationship of exploration is that I build a bond with her uh, by when you, when you cook, you just don't cook and listen listen to the instruction. You hear stories of, of what the, she did in the past, how she learned it, where she learned from, who she did it with, and so forth. So you build a relationship and struggle. She tells the story how she traveled, and then she was able to do stuff like, uh, you know, running away as a refugee, living in the jungle, you know, how they do that. And so I think the exploration of food for me has built connection with my grandmother. My, my, my paternal grandmother, at least. So I have, I have to expect, I, I love that part about food exploration with my grandmother. Wonderful. How is that rice liquor? Is it good? <laughs> Super it's strong? I'm the 20% proof. I was just going to say, oh my goodness. You never get hangover. That's the thing I like about rice liquor. You never get hangover. <laughs> no, well, hey, that's all right. Especially yeah. with 120 proof. Oh my gosh. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in on that question? Yeah, sure, I can. Um, so this question makes me think of two individuals specifically. The first one is my stepdad, who is not Asian. He's He is a white guy from LA. Um, but coincidentally, he, is, he has a collection of Filipino books that he goes through, I mean, from like the 80s up to now, and he goes through them in hopes that my mom will find something that will remind her of home. I mean, they've been together for a long time now, and but he's still trying to impress her, which I think is really sweet. Um, but with him, since we are both exploring um, Filipino cuisine, it's been very interesting to have these discussions with him. Like he's super keen, not just on making the foods, but like, oh, this style of, for example, adobo chicken is made this way, but this cookbook has it this way. And can I make it, his name is Bill. He's like, can I make it Bill's way? And my mom's like, nope, there's no Bill's way. There's only a Filipino way you cook it like that. Um, but yeah, I think 
because we're both, well, I'm definitely Americanized and he's, you know, he was born in LA. Um, so we've had that bond just like de developed our more already close bond just in our exploration of how um, Filipino food works in the United States. And the second person that I would, that this question brought to mind is a friend of mine who is from Beijing. She's uh, living in Pittsburgh now, but it's interesting to like seeing, um, as I alluded to before, seeing the commonalities and the influence of Chinese cuisine in the Philippines. And she didn't know that there's so much history of Chinese immigration in the Philippines. And I didn't either, obviously. So it's really enlightening to talk to her about how such and such food, like for example, okay, I thought, I really thought like soup dumplings came from the Philippines again. And she'll, she'll share me, she'll share with me some tidbits and I'll show, share with her. Oh yeah. Like I was called such and such because my face was round. Anyway, um, I digress, but yeah. So yeah, it's just been really interesting to learn with other people, like the different journeys that the food, you know, our customs take around the world. I completely agree. That is my interest in culinary interests. That's redundant. But my whole, and I feel like, like it's a quote from Anthony Bourdain, but if you really want to know a person and their culture, know their food. And there's just so much wrapped up in, in a, a cuisine of a certain area of the world and the stories that are involved in that. And I, I find it very fascinating. And I also think it's really sweet that your stepdad is still trying to impress your mom and like, doing all that stuff that's yay bill round of applause for bill okay um anyone else want to weigh in on that question we have a couple of other ones in the chat i think i saw danilo had his hand up oh danilo sorry please go ahead <laughs> uh you're, you're muted <laughs> okay keeps them forgetting that um so my cooking or my learning how to cook makes me very popular at the office, especially during holidays, because I would cook Filipino food. Everybody will buy something from the grocery store, you know, or, you know, uh, and so I like to cook pancit, okay? And I play around with different ingredients and, and see how will that work. I have pancit on chicken, pancit on pork, pancit on, on shrimp, you know, and see, and then just different vegetables on top of it. So that's one specialty I've learned very well. The other one is I've learned to cook um, adobo very well, uh, the Filipino way. <laughs> but then people will ask me, do you cook this from scratch? And said, no, I buy a packet from the farmer's market, you know, with all the ingredients. <laughs> but then I would, as usual, I would put my sugar, you know, to make it a little sweet, you know, or I would, you know, either um, brine or, um, uh soak the the meat the night before in a coke for example the soft drinks you know or or seven up you know uh soda so it gives a different taste or maybe wine like white wine and see how will that work so i've learned to experiment with that food so i'm always i think the scary part is always bringing the food to the office and hoping nobody would say oh god i don't i don't like this you know what i mean so you always hold your breath you know every time you you share food to somebody you know because for you it's okay but you never know you know and you know i would put warnings and then i would bring soy sauce and everything and lemons you know so for them to to, to make it a little different so um, so that's really improved my, I guess, my office relationships, you know, during holidays. Yeah. I was saying, I want to come work with you. Hence, it is one of my absolute favorite dishes. I was introduced, I lived in Chicago for many years, and uh, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to have um, some Filipino friends, and they introduced me to it. And it's still one of my, I used to say it was my hangover cure. That was many years ago. So... <laughs> Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, this one is fun. Uh, this is from actually from Sarah, but she says, this is a weird question. Oh, wait, I just lost it. Dang it. Uh, short grain rice, short grain or long grain, long grain, sticky or no? Go. Depend on what you're cooking, depend on who you are eating with. Yeah. Like for example, um, most people like short grain, 
But if you're lowland, they like short and sticky rice. So depending on your culture. And right. so it also depends on how you cook it. But on the other side, if you make a dessert, most people like sticky rice, so they can pound mm -hmm. it to mochi, you know, like mochi, pan, you know, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I think it just depends on that. And, you know, that's all I, I like short rice. Sorry. You Okay. So there's the answer. You like short rice. Yep. I like short rice too, but sticky. Anyone else? Also, it depends how much water you want to put in your rice, you know, to boil, you know, because then it gets really soft whether they're sticky, uh, they're long grain or short grain. So I, you know, we use rice cooker most of the time here in the U.S., not the usual where you have to do measure how, you know, with your thumb one way or the other, how high is the water. So, so for me, water is critical, you know, when you're cooking rice. Yeah. So I, I cook rice almost daily and um, I was made fun of by a coworker who will not be named because I do not use a rice cooker and I cook it on my stove. And mm -hmm. so I was informed that I should get a rice cooker. I still don't have one though. So maybe is that is that nuts? Did I cook it on my stove? Yeah, there, there, there are many ways of cooking rice. I just found that out. And also, uh, in my culture, I think uh, me, I think Hmong and Korean. I think I only see Korean does it. Is you cook your rice, and after rice, let it sit for a while, and put your rice in a bowl and put cold water in there and eat it with other stuff. Try it in a hot day. Uh, that sounds good, and I will definitely be trying that. Thank you. Yeah, Anna, you, you actually would have been someone that confused me because I thought everyone had a rice cooker growing up. So yeah. <laughs> when I <laughs> went over don't. to a friend's house for the first time and they were pouring rice into a pot, I was like, what are you doing? Where's your <laughs> rice cooker? <laughs> that was essentially the conversation. When I said that I was I made rice on the stove, that was the reaction. What? Where's your rice cooker? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Yeah, um, I felt the same way too. Yeah. It's what? But Anna, Anna, okay. Okay, uh, Tina, you want to say Oh, something? I was going to say, uh, yeah, rice cooker all the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> but here's one thing about not using rice cooker. Growing up, as children, we love what we call dukot. That means the burn rice you know if you're not using rice this rice cooker does not burn the rice what i mean uh it you know it stops when it's cooked but if you're not using rice cooker most probably you burn the bottom of the pot you know and that's the best that's the best okay so i'm not nuts i like it when it gets the crispy layer from when i don't pay attention and it grows a little too long and that whole bottom part that's like crispy oh i love that so it's not just me or cook rice in a bamboo. The fragrance of yeah. the bamboo mixed with rice. I have a little coconut, that. sugar, and a little Ooh. salt. Try that. <laughs> I have another one that says, I love burnt rice. Yay, burnt <laughs> rice lovers, unite. <laughs> it's not just me. Um, do any of the other panelists have a rice dispenser? I did not know this was a thing. Rice dispenser, anyone? No. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Can you explain what that is? I don't know that dispenser is the right word, but it's it's basically just a, at least in my parents' house, it is just a maybe a three foot plastic box that, you know, you oh, push a button and gives you like two cups. Oh my gosh. But they neat. don't have a rice cooker. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> they don't. See? Rice dispenser, no rice cooker. I don't know, just that... like, I'll eyeball this. Oh, see, I, I'm, I would be terrible. At, I'm terrible at eyeballing in general. But I, I like the idea of it, like dispensing the perfect amount of rice. So maybe that, maybe I go the dispenser route. Sorry, I'm sorry, just to join in here. <laughs> I knew Sarah, I'm like waiting for it. I can't, Come on, I can't, I can't. Okay, so um, my my family, I'm, I'm uh, Japanese. And so um, we, we have strong feelings about rice. And I remember going to a friend's house when I was young and they were they were a white family and they had like minute rice that like really mm -hmm. like unsticky rice and I remember thinking oh dear her mother doesn't know how to cook rice how embarrassing for her I will not say anything and then later on when I was exposed to other types of rice I, I realized that that um, there are other kinds. And I wondered if everybody thought that my mother didn't know how to cook rice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the one thing I wanted to say is that the, the, the cup of rice is different, right? 
it's not the same. It's a smaller cup. It's like three quarters of a cup, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that always makes a big difference too. So I'm going to go away now. No, I, just have I didn't think that's interesting though. Can, does, why only what, the sm smaller measurement? Like, is it a, a metric thing? Is it like, where's the... I, I don't know. No? I don't know. I mean, for me, if you're cooking Japanese rice, you have to use it. It's a three quarters cup. And otherwise you're going to get too much rice or I was gonna I say a volume of rice. I didn't know yeah. that. That's that's fascinating. Thank you for sharing, Sarah. All right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone has a question though. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, Evan, one of our attendees, um, asks, what would you like to see happen in your future as pertains to your journey slash relationship with your culinary traditions? Feel free to answer anyone. I really like to learn how to cook dessert. I love dessert, you know, like Filipinos, you know, there's there's a lot of like you have this Brazos de Mercedes, you know, all you know, they're fattening, but I love them. You know, there's a lot of like cotinta, you know, all this coconut, you know, gelatinous stuff, you know. But I've never learned, you know, I maybe I can cook suman, which is, you know, uh, rice and then mix with sugar and all of that, you know, but but yeah, that's that's my my direction, you know, that I can cook the the, the dinners and the, the main dishes, but never the you know the desserts. Although I know how to make leche plan, although it's not the best, but leche plan is good. Yeah. It's eggs and it's custard, I think that's how they call it here. Like a custard. like a tres leches sort of a situation yeah. like that? Yes. Yeah, or yes, a plan. Correct. Yeah, okay. plan. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I would like to learn about how to make soup much better. My mother makes the best soup. Mm -hmm. I can't. I, I don't know what she does. I mean, again, she doesn't measure. She just adds whatever feels right, you mm -hmm. know. And I try to mimic her, and it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I would like to learn how to make it better. So I think um, I would have to talk to her more and see how to make the kind of soup that she likes to make. Mm -hmm. It's not and the same. Share though. that with me, because I feel the same way. I, I don't, I mean, there's something about someone that just has it in their blood about what to add to make a really good soup or a broth or a stock, because I don't have that. And I'm super jealous of that, those people that can just throw that together, like boil a whole chicken and it tastes good. And I'm like, oh, how? <laughs> Anyhow, anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah, if this was a if this was five years ago, my answer to this would have been I want to get all the recipes before my uh, before my parents and their brothers and sisters die. <laughs> but I feel like I have captured a lot of it, and I think that at this point my journey is kind of nonlinear. And the thing that I've been really thinking about lately is that there's this great old Japanese movie called Tempopo, and it's. it's 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 it has everything in it um and it's all about this in part this journey to make ramen so i have it in my head that i really want to try to make like a, a legit ramen which i hear can take a lot of time <laughs> um i feel you on the ramen situation and yes this is the reason why i buy the amazing broth that comes in a little box or they have those amazing umami starters now that you can i mean like so I have no, I, I mean, I have a reason to, because it would be amazing to cook ramen from scratch, but there are so many people that do it much better than me. So why not let them <laughs> Um, I've never heard of Tampopo. What, like what era are we talking? <laughs> 80s, 80s, right? 80s, yeah, 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 it's yeah, a, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm always down for, um, uh, oh, 1985. Thank you, Evan according to Google. Yeah, I don't think, I think it's really hard to find streaming. So I think maybe you can only rent or buy the DVD. You know what's really yeah. awful about working for a library? You can get all yeah. kinds of stuff. Just <laughs> shout out to the library. That, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have this amazing thing called WorldCat where it lets you share with all the libraries in the country. I'll find Cam Popo, don't you worry. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't, right? Exactly. Come on, Brian. Um, okay. Um, I have a question for everyone. 
Um, also, a uh, follow up question to the one that we just asked. If there is, you know, I know that Tina mentioned like that her mother makes the most amazing soup, but Danilo, if when it comes to dessert, is there a relationship to a family member or a friend, like something in particular that makes you want to learn more about dessert or is it just that you love it? Or is there a connection there to your family? I'm always curious about that. If that's the direction that you're going in, um, it, what's the motivation other than the fact that it tastes good? Here's what's funny, and my mother will kill me for talking about this. My mother does not know how to cook. So what I mean, when my sisters <laughs> were in their teenage years, she sent them to cooking school because she was afraid that they will not learn how to cook. And, and, and well, I never went to cooking school, but, you know, I've learned things on my own. But that was really interesting. Um, and, I, I, and so one time my mother, and this is how, why my mother does not cook. One time she visited me here. I was in Ohio. And then I came home from work. And she said, uh, uh, something happened. I said, I don't know what happened. Um, she, rice cooker, right? There's the, 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 the thing where you, where you cook the rice. She put that inside the microwave. I can see your eyes. Yeah. And so she said, so I look at her like, and she said, oh, I pulled the plug. It said, okay, let's go and buy a new microwave. <laughs> so I know, I hope my mother doesn't see this. Well, your mother and my mother are going to both have it out with us. We're saying that they can't cook. So I'm right there with you. Um, and just a shout out to Anna in the chat. Uh, she said that Tom Popo is on HBO Max which oh, I subscribe okay. to in addition to your local public library. But in case anyone was wondering about streaming, that's where it is. Hooray. Now we're done. I'm going to watch it. Um, uh, my next question, oh, hold on, I have to get my little screen back up. Um, are there specific cooking techniques or tools for preparing food that have a special meaning in your community or to yourself or your family? And if so, why and what is the history associated with them? It's a very academic question, but I am curious. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. You, you, you cut out for me. Kind of cut out. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, are there specific cooking techniques or tools for preparing food that have special meaning in your community? I'm not really sure how to answer that question, but here's one Filipino food that I think people are familiar with. They call it Bloody Mary. I'm not sure if you're, you know, it's dinuguan. Dinuguan is when you slaughter a pig, you get the intestines, you chop into small pieces, uh, pieces and then then the blood of the pig and you boil it you know, and it comes out of the soup but it's it's not like soupy soup you know it's more um i don't want to say sticky but more gelatinous to an extent you know it's it's more like a casserole type you know but it's dark because it's it's pig's blood you know but it's really good you put like peppers and all the different kinds of ingredients and so most of my friends call it or people i know call it bloody mary because and then you know they don't tell people you know what it is you know until they start tasting it and said oh it's good what is this and then they tell it you know it's pig's blood you know and and, and then people go crazy but um <laughs> No, I forgot your question. <laughs> <about> <laughs> you it. answered it. I mean, it yeah. was any cooking techniques that were specific to your community. And I definitely yes. think that's one. It's like the first time someone has haggis or something, you know, mm -hmm. like they, you can't tell people what, or sweetbreads. I always use, I, I love sweetbreads. I think they're delicious. I mean, sorry to any vegans or vegetarians in the room, but I, I love them. They're delicious. But if someone told me it was pancreas before I tasted it, I probably wouldn't have tried it. But sweetbreads, hmm. You know, not so bad, but they are delicious. Would anyone else like to weigh in on the um, the tools or techniques for the community? We have a another question in the chat after that. All right. Okay. Question. I kind of have a funny story. Oh, I want to hear uh, it. Oh, sorry. No, I want to hear it. <laughs> uh, it's it's it 
it doesn't have to do with my community, but my, my dad hated cleaning up things. Um, so I wouldn't suggest this or recommend this as a technique, but what he would do is he would just spread out newspapers around the stove and every once in a while it would catch on fire. And my mom would just yell at him every time he ever did that. <laughs> so when I, uh, but I get nostalgic about it a little bit when I think about cooking, I, I don't put newspapers around the stove, but it's no, something but this, that kind this- of, passes of, through my head but the smell of burning paper now is nostalgic for you right you're like you smell that and you're like oh my gosh oh, i love it so much honestly i, I think the that's fire kind of genius. i mean not the catching on fire part but i also don't like to clean up messes so i'm always like figuring out how to make a package out of something so i can just like wrap it up and toss it so i i think your dad's a genius um okay question one, from... one thing we have not mentioned go ahead okay we talk a lot about meat, but uh, like for Filipinos, uh, because it's uh, 7,100 islands, fish. Fish is very popular in the Philippines and there are different ways of cooking fish. Uh, whether it's a soup type fish, you know, and they would put tamarind or guava, you know, to make it um, a more sour taste, um, or, you know, they would sweeten it a little bit, um, or, um, like um, catfish, you know what I mean? Did you catch in the rice fields in the river and all of that? So when I go home to the Philippines, that's a favorite one that would my but my mother would buy because I she knows that I don't really get it, you know, in the U.S. The and maybe I can get it in the farmers market, but they're farm catfish, and they taste a little different, you know. But uh, the ones that goes in the rice fields or in the rivers, you know, in the Philippines are have a different taste. And then you, uh, okay, sinugba, what's this? You put it in a, like barbecue type, you know what I mean? Uh, and so that's a different dele- delicacy, you know, with uh, in the Philippines. Also oysters and crabs, you know are the other thing you know for filipinos and oysters and crabs and those are shells are more for like what they call sumsuman which is um when you're drinking you know with friends you know that's the what what's the term in 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 english or in american you know that goes with the eating you know the socializing the shells or the oysters or shrimps or crabs you know to go with beer or or whiskey, you know, while you're having fun with your friends. Oh, like um, bar food? So. Or happy hour? <laughs> so I can yeah, do some, some, happy hour. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> like they, they're not in bars. Yeah, they're not in bars, but at yeah. home, you know, sharing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, do you have any struggles with finding ingredients where you are? Have you made any food hacks that you could share if you have had difficulty? Yes, yes. Uh, just very quickly, um, I don't cook Filipino food that often and this particular food, it's called sinigang, it's a soup. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, see, <laughs> Danilo knows. Um, and I've had it, where I've had it before, other people have prepared it. They use this leafy green, it's called kangkong, which I guess mm-hmm. is water spinach. Mm-hmm. And since I grew up in Colorado, um, this particular this particular vegetable was hard to find. So uh, my stepdad would usually use like any other kind of leafy greens. Here in DC, I can just go to any of the Asian supermarkets or even there's a, a near me, there's a, a Japanese bodega and they have bok choy. So I usually mm-hmm. just substitute for that. The taste is very similar. Of course, I don't have a refined palate, so. One thing that I'm lucky in Atlanta, we have, I think, two farmers market. I, I do have to drive about an hour to get there, you know, but, you know, usually uh, for Filipinos, um, it's where I sent my balikbayan boxes also at the same time. So I would, um, what I would do is I have a cooler. And so I would like, Every time I visit, I would spend like a hundred dollars on fish or other things or vegetables and then load it in the cooler. And so that would last me for about a month or so in terms of food. So 
So I feel lucky that, you know, I was able to do that. It's, it's a little distant from where I'm at, but, you know, at least, you know, I can do that once a month. Yeah, I don't have any hacks because I'm luckily lucky enough to live in a big city in the Boston area that I can find mm -hmm. a lot. There's a lot of Asian grocery stores here. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can find pretty much anything you want if it's not like, especially with the, the bigger the grocery store, the big chain stores here. Like, you know, you can go to H Mart, probably find what what you want there. Also, you can buy from H Mart online, which is what I do. It's the best thing ever. Yeah, I, I will say the one thing that I miss most about living in a big city is the food and the access to ingredients that you can't get. I mean, I love Jackson for many reasons, but we don't have, we still have the selection. And so um, not to mention no Chinatown or no little Vietnam or any of those other places that you can go and get really authentic food. So I miss the food. Um, and Danilo, there's a question about the Balik Bayan boxes. Am I saying yeah. that right? Yes, uh, yes. Would you be able to um, tell us more about those? Okay. So Balik Bayan boxes are like big boxes that you can stuff things, uh, food codes, anything that you want to send to your relatives in the Philippines. And it has uh, weight does not count. So you can make it as heavy as you want. You can make it full as long as within the box. And uh, like for me, I pay about uh, $100 to, uh, it will take about three months to get to the Philippines because it's by ship, okay? Uh, but um, so usually you I, you time it during three months before Christmas. So you wanna send all these gifts to your family, whether they're, they're uh, American, like coffee, so some people put soap, you know, anything, you know, from America that, you know, and then when they open it, it says made it, and sometimes, you know, it's made in the Philippines. <laughs> so that's a funny part in all of that. But uh, a lot of Filipinos do that to send, um, you know, material things to their relatives. Uh, I I do because I'm working in an academic setting, so there's a lot of like books that um, like you know faculty after a while, you know, they would put books that they don't use anymore. So I collect those books, put them in the boxes because there's no weight, and send it to the universities or colleges in the Philippines. You know, so they can use those books. Yeah. That's amazing. And Charisma just pointed out that Balik is to return, return. and Bayan is country. So there we go. Thank you for sharing that. I have never heard of that, but um, that's amazing that you can literally, if there's no weight limit. I wonder what the heaviest Balik Bayan box ever was that was sent. <laughs> See, this is where my brain goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, I have a general question for our panelists. I know we've talked a little bit about, you know, family rituals. But what is everyone's favorite holiday? And it doesn't have to be related to, you know, um, your culinary heritage, but what's your favorite holiday with related with regards to food in general? I would say that's uh, for me, it's the Lunar New Year, because that's mm -hmm. when you get a lot of food, a lot of family together. That's, it's like our um, for me, it's like a our family reunion you know, we get all everybody together, even if it's, you know, you don't see them once, you know, you only see them once a year, it's during the Lunar New Year, and everybody brings, it's like a big potluck, you know, you bring food in, and it doesn't have to be, you know, about Chinese food or Asian food, it can be, you know, we've, somebody, you know, somebody in my family brought hamburgers one time, <laughs> so it's more about, you know, the getting together part, you know, a family reunion. With awesome food. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? What, what was interesting, very similar to Tina, uh, for me, it's, um, we call it in my language, Pisam Namatai, which is uh, the, the Day of the Dead, which is All Souls Day, you know, it is November 1st. Um, it's also a gathering, you know, a gathering in terms of uh, going to the cemetery, cleaning the plots, you know, and you have not seen these plots for a year. And so it's a formal reunion. But then um, growing up, my memories is that, you know, we would prepare all these desserts, this suman, you know, sticky rice and all of this, you know. And then uh, the family would, um, before everybody eats, would grab some parts of it and put it in a different room, 
as like a like an offering to to the dead you know who's supposed to come out you know during that day and and visit you and so so for me that's really memorable but the other thing that i really enjoyed is in the philippines the cemeteries are like they're like they're ab above the ground, you know, they're stuck, you know, like three stories. And so people would like put candles and all when I was young, we would run around and how can make the biggest candle ball, you know, what I mean? So, we, you know, you're going to watch everybody's candle and it's like all the drips and then like a giant that's... wax ball. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, so that's really marvel for me as a way of celebrating the dead, but also part of, you know, the food and, you know, just, you know, seeing your friends because suddenly you see your friends in, not in school, but in a totally different settings. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. And also who did you ever win with the giant wax ball that like, you know, get the biggest one? No. Well, you know, with your cousins, yeah, sitting there, you know what I mean, you know, and bowls that have the biggest wax ball or something like that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, anyone else have any uh, holidays they would like to share about? Thanksgiving, but not for the reasons you think. Okay. Thanksgiving <laughs> in Charisma Lee's household as an only child with my stepdad and my mom um, meant special pizza night because in the Philippines anyway, there's no Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many Filipino American households have great Thanksgiving, but in, in our home, it was just, we had pizza other nights too, but I just knew for sure, Thanksgiving, we were gonna have pizza, whether it's for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I was gonna have pizza at some point. So that's my, that's my culinary heritage. Okay, so what's your favorite pizza then? So what, like if ultimate special pizza for Charisma Lee is? Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> because I love pizza. You could tell I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, before I was vegetarian, I liked sausage and pineapple mm -hmm. pizza. And so now good. I'm now I like spinach and black olives specifically. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm a black olive fan myself. Mm -hmm. But I will say add some jalapenos to that sausage and pineapple. Super good. If you're not vegetarian, of course. <laughs> <laughs> or you can use the um, what's the amazing uh the plant oh, beyond meat yeah possible burger yeah, those are delicious tofu yes there's so many options so add that with jalapenos and pineapple yum super good i digress in japan it's all about squid pizza which i'm sure is super good i mean it's, you know in italy we have shrimp pizza which i also love which i thought shrimp on pizza that's totally weird until i had it with pesto and it's like the most amazing thing ever so i bet you squid so what's sarah you have to weigh in as far as what's the other toppings with squid pizza in Japan? Is it a cheese situation or just like a different sauce? Oh yeah, no cheese. Yeah, so I, I was curious. I, yeah, I, I think cheese isn't always super popular <laughs> in Asian yeah. countries. Well, that's well, actually, yes, we have had that conversation before. But okay, so yeah. what's the squid pizza? It's it's just like a tomato sauce, which is kind of weird, but like all kinds of different. It's I mean, squid is maybe is that the right word? I don't know. It's they're like calamari yeah. that's italian yeah oh. maybe kind of like calamari sure. or is it cuttlefish i mean it's ika so oh, I don't is know. it squid i don't know <laughs> um and then other seafood too so it's like a seafood pizza but Yum. it's delicious so yeah good. sounds like it cuttlefish Thank you. there you go the okay i that was my second okay i was look at that so maybe not squid cuttlefish <laughs> cuttlefish very close <laughs> <laughs> same family thank you thank you anna coates you, she is my just, favorite person yes, today, yes right i was gonna yeah. say she is clutch with all this information thank you anna it's because of her name i know you exactly. know just, just pointing that out okay well you know what we have reached the end of our hour i can't believe it went this fast this was so much fun Huge thank you to all of our panelists, Brian, Charisma, Tina, Danilo, and Tujer, who I know had some um, tech issues and lost connection. So I'm so sorry that he didn't finish out our evening with us, but thank you so much for being a part of this. Just in case you would like to share this with um, your friends and family, whoever, we're going to post this on Facebook. Um, I should have it up. I know we were streaming live, but I think the first part got cut off. So we'll have the whole video up hopefully tomorrow. And um, everyone have a fabulous evening. And thank you so much for having or er, joining us.
Thank you.